after you're done talking, Travis. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, we're going to allow a couple minutes here for people to get into the room. Thank you all for being here. And it looks like Deborah, you raised your hand. If you have a question, if you want to put it in the chat, um, I'm happy to help answer that. And we'll just be starting in a few minutes here. All right, looks like we have a couple more people coming in and then we will get started. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Hello everyone and welcome to River Resilience 101. Hope you are in the right Zoom room. We hope, uh, or thank you guys for joining us today. I am Megan Mayla Heath and I'm the marketing manager with uh, Coalition for the Pretty River Watershed. Um, just a few housekeeping items for you all today. Uh, let me go to my next slide here if it'll move. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and we will email the link to you all um, in an email that will come out to you tomorrow through Zoom. Uh, the webinar will last for approximately one hour. We will have time at the end for uh, Q&A, so please put uh, any questions you have in the chat um, or in the Q&A box. And then also please stay connected with us afterwards. Uh, our website, pooterwatershed.org, has a ton of resources, blog. You can sign up for our email newsletter there. And then, of course, we've got all the social media accounts at Pooter Watershed. Um, so you can stay up to date with a lot of news, information, resources there as well. Um, just a quick overview here about uh, CPRW. Um, we were formed as a result of the Hewlett Gulch and High Park fires that occurred in the summer of 2012, those fires burned about 95,000 acres within the Upper Pooter Watershed. Um, these fires were really a call to action for many organizations within Larimer County. And soon after, um, the High Park Restoration Coalition was formed. Um, this was kind of an informal network at first, um, but the group was very successful at identifying a lot of the top priorities for post-fire restoration and uh, finding funding to implement those plans and then also training volunteers to help uh, with the implementation. So based on a lot of these early successes, uh, the coalition evolved into more of a formal nonprofit in May of 2013 called the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed or CPRW. So um, our, at CPRW, our mission is to improve and maintain the ecological health of the Poudre River through uh, most importantly, community collaboration. And our work is guided by uh, a core set of values, um, inclusiveness. We work daily to include the viewpoints, knowledge, and beliefs of a range of stakeholders. Uh, we believe in collaboration over conflict. Uh, so we really strive to find innovative win-win solutions to a lot of the complex and cross-jurisdictional challenges that face our watershed. Um, transparency. We believe that true collaboration um, can only be achieved when we act with complete transparency. Uh, we take a science-based approach in our work, so we believe that relying on the best available science is the strongest foundation for making sustainable uh, decisions in the face of many uncertainties that we face in our watershed. Uh, we're committed to finding solutions that provide tangible, measurable, and lasting results for our organization and, of course, for our watershed. And then we um, believe in responsible stewardship. So we are committed to careful stewardship of not only the Poudre River watershed resources, but also the resources of our organization. Um, so that's a little bit about CPRW. Now to introduce our wonderful speakers for today. We have Hallie Strevey, who's the interim executive director here at CPRW. Um, Hallie's been with the organization for uh, over six years now. She's an incredible asset to CPRW. We're happy to have her here today. 
And then Johannes Beebe, a senior hydrologist at Stillwater Sciences, uh, Sciences and then uh, Travis Stroth, who is a water resources engineer at Stillwater. So I'm gonna stop talking here and go ahead and hand it off to Hallie. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thanks, yeah. Megan. And then I didn't know if you wanted to launch that poll um, so we could see who is joining us today before yes. I jump in. Thank you for the reminder. So yeah. launch this poll here, um, just a quick, who is in the room? This will help uh, just us better understand our audience here. So what best describes you? And you can only pick one here. So I know these might, might be multiple describers here, but pick one. Great, we're almost to 100%. A couple more folks, if you wanna put your answers in. All right, so let's see who we have in the room here. I'm gonna share the results. Great, so we have a good mix of folks here. I'm sure everyone's a concerned citizen at some point, but <laughs> all right. So thank you guys for answering that. And I'll send it back to Hallie. Sounds great. Thanks everyone. And then uh, Travis, if you can share your presentation there. Yeah, is that that look? Is that working there? Not seeing it yet. Okay, let me try to exit the presentation view here. There we go. It's coming up now. Okay, if that'll work now. Yep, yeah, looks like right. it's. Okay. Ready? Okay. All right, great. Thank you, Travis. So as Megan mentioned, and as you all know, you're here to learn about this River Resiliency 101. So what does River Resiliency mean and what is CPRW doing in the Cache La watershed to increase this resiliency of our watershed and our river corridor? Next slide, Travis. So when I think about resiliency, I always, my, my next thought is what are the stressors uh, facing our watershed? So when we think about resiliency, what we're really first thinking about is, is these various stressors and a lot of them are interconnected. So if you live in Colorado and if you're from the Front Range and, and live in the Cache La Poudre watershed, you know that we've seen a lot of various stressors over the past 10 years from the High Park fire in 2012 to last year's Cameron Peak fire, which burned over 200,000 acres in the watershed. We also had the 2013 flood event, um, which this picture in the very top corner, you can see this is the culmination of both a fire and a flood. So this is Stove Prairie Road um, and Skin Gulch. So Skin Gulch is a stream um, that now flows perennially after the High Park fire and after a big, a big rain event, uh, the stream ended up washing out Stove Prairie Road. Um, so just kind of an example of some of these stressors um, and, you know, how, how this, the resiliency factor plays in. There's also drought and climate change, of course, and then um, insects and disease. So in the past 20 years, our forests have seen lots of issues with beetle kill and other diseases um, uh, of, of trees. And then we also have the human factor, which is land use and development. So, of course, um, when we have these pressures of development and, and people using the river corridor, people building um, close to our rivers and in the headwaters, um, those are uh, other stressors that are placed on the watershed. Next slide, Travis. So what is watershed resiliency? So when we think about a resilient watershed, it is a watershed that's actually able to respond and recover from an extreme event like a fire and a flood. So uh, resilient watershed won't suffer this permanent loss of function. So we have all these ecosystem um, services that our, that our watersheds provide for us like clean, clean drinking water. Uh, a resilient watershed will be able to recover from these events. Um, and we at CPRW and others across the Front Range are really focused on these watershed restoration projects to improve our watershed resilience to both natural and human disturbance. And that's what we'll be going into in a little bit more detail today. Both Johannes and Travis will be talking about some of those examples. Next slide. 
So when we look at building resiliency in the cash depleter watershed, we like to refer to this resiliency triangle. Um, so what we're really looking at is this flood risk, reducing the risk of flooding and that geomorphic risk. So increasing the protection and safety of important assets in the river corridor. We're looking to improve stream health. And then when we have both of those, we're able to reduce the recovery time and costs when an event like a flood happens. And then we can also increase our flexibility and our ability to respond to events. Um, and that's how we kind of, how we think about resiliency in a lot of the work that we do. Next slide. Can we actually increase river resiliency? Johannes and Travis will again go into more detail about this, but what we really strive to do and what we think about is making room for the river. So what, what this means is allowing the river to access its floodplain in areas where it makes sense. So when you allow the river to, instead of being kind of uh, barred in by riprap, et cetera, when you allow the river to access its floodplain, it can reduce the flood risk to other infrastructure and other assets that we might have in the floodplain. It also can reduce the need for future repairs and maintenance. And then in areas where, um, where it makes sense, actually allowing that disturbance to happen because rivers need disturbance, um, watersheds need disturbance. And that's really, um, you know, it's a, it's a core part of, of what a watershed needs to be healthy and resilient. And so where it makes sense, allowing this to happen, this can also help reduce the risk of flood and also um, improves riparian and aquatic habitat. Next slide. So CPRW has been working hard over um, the past few years to increase resiliency of the river and the watershed. So in 2017, uh, we worked with our stakeholders, including uh, Windsor, Weld County, uh, um, and City of Greeley to develop this plan. It was a post-fire recovery and river resiliency master plan. So this was following the 2013 flood event, um, which many of you know if you were around then that watersheds up and down the Front Range experienced um, ex extreme devastating impacts from that flood. The Pooter did as well, but it wasn't as um, severe as some of the other, other watersheds. But there were still um, unmet needs and it really showed the need to start working towards increasing this, the resiliency of our river. So within the plan, we prioritized um, unmet recovery and restoration needs. Uh, we identified opportunities to improve river resilience. The team um, also modeled sediment transport. So how sediment moves throughout the system which really has a big role to play in um, the function of the river and river resiliency as well. And then we also uh, used all of this data um, to create these concept plans that we still use today to kind of guide our design and, um, and that include all the different ideas for what a resilient river means. So we're, we're using those concept plans today and I'll go into that a little bit in a little bit more detail shortly. Next slide. So just also wanted to point out where this master plan project area was. So the biggest impacts from the 2013 flood were actually east of I-25. And so the river resiliency uh, master plan um, started east of I-25. So right where uh, the town of Timnath is and went all the way to the confluence of the South Platte. So this is 36 miles of the river corridor. And um, within these 36 miles, we took one to two mile reaches and prioritize those for resilient restoration opportunities. Next slide. So this is an example of one of the concept plans. So this one is actually one that we are currently working on um, increasing the design. So this concept plan is really, um, it's just that a concept plan. So lots of really big ideas here, all resilient river ideas like adding large wood, um, removing assets out of the floodplain like the Poudre River Trail, which causes a lot of issues um, in this reach. There's three private landowners in this reach as well, so we're, we're starting to work really closely with them. The idea behind these concept plans was if, if we had all the money and the approval in the world, this is kind of what we would do. This is, this is how we would want the river to look. Uh, we know that's not the case. We don't have, um, we probably won't ever get the funding or an 
to do all of these ideas, um, to implement all of these ideas. And there's there's definitely restrictions on what we can do be, just because of the development and the land use that is in, within this reach. Um, so that's kind of where that collaboration piece comes into play and working with landowners really closely to figure out the best ways to increase river resiliency while uh, maintaining that working river aspect, because we know that there's development, there's gravel mining, there's agriculture, there's all of those important um, land use um, activities taking place actually in this reach alone, um, along with most of the river corridor. And so we're really trying to come up with ways that we can have those other um, land uses happening while also maintaining river resilience. And with that, I will kick it over to Travis, I think. Yes, thank you. And thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us on this. Uh, let me get to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start by going through, uh, expanding on what Hallie talked about with some more generalized concepts of uh, river resiliency and river health and function. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Johannes to talk more specifically about a few project examples of how we've been doing this. Um, and then particularly about a, a new project that's starting right now um, that was from the Lower Poudre Master Plan as Hallie was just uh, describing. Uh, so we wanted to start with this quote um, that we thought was that we came across recently that we thought was sort of brilliant to sum up what we're talking about here um, for a project we had on the South Fork of the Republican River, which is in southeastern Colorado uh, and borders Colorado and goes into uh, Kansas. Uh, there was a very large, we came across this article, it was a very large flood event in 1935 down there that was uh, very catastrophic uh, for many of the towns down there. And there was loss of life uh, and they were interviewing uh, a, a, a local Native American chief uh, and regarding the flood he simply said uh, white man built too close to the river uh, and uh, that's a very simple topic but honestly it's uh, somewhat tied into uh, what my career has been so far and a lot of the challenges uh, we've had. Uh, the idea is that they've obviously been living there a long time and they had observed very large flood events in the area that he's described were bluff to bluff. Um, and they sort of learned from those experiences uh, um, and tried to move further away from the river and not battle, battle nature in that sense, uh, which is what we have done in a lot of areas, of course. Um, and, you know, obviously through time, we haven't had that type of information and we don't know any better, but as Ali was describing, we've, we've had these big events happen um, recently in 2013, all the fires and a bunch of things happening just in this local Poudre watershed uh, that we're in. Uh, and of course, moving forward, uh, anything we can do to learn from those, uh, it, we can be more resilient moving forward. So this is just an uh, example, actually, the Mississippi River. Um, this picture on the left side of the screen here is just mapping all the different flow paths through time. Uh, of where the channel was did occupy the floodplain at one point, uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, and it's just kind of beautiful, actually. It kind of looks like art, but as you can see, it, um, it's been everywhere <laughs> in the active valley bottom. Uh, and obviously, if we uh, build and have infrastructure in these areas, uh, it's high risk uh, for the channel to come back to that location, and we will be battling nature in that sense. Uh, some of the, these two pictures on the left, or sorry, your right side of your screen, uh, are two examples of how we sort of have tried to battle nature in this sense. Uh, things like levees and uh, riprap walls and stuff to constrain rivers. Uh, this top right here is a gigantic levee uh, on the Mississippi River, uh, which does uh, a good job until it doesn't, is what we sort of say, right? It, it, it does a great job of keeping floodwaters out of where we might have development in the floodplain until it's overtopped. Uh, right, and then it's catastrophic and things can go uh, uh, very badly and be very destructive, of course. Uh, this bottom right is, is a very extreme scenario, but we came across and thought it would be worth showing uh, the extents that we've gone to, right, um, to try to control nature and, uh, uh, you know, live where we want, even if it's a higher risk area. Uh, so another, probably the most uh, extreme example uh, of trying to control a river corridor in the United States uh, is the Los Angeles River. Uh, the, the picture on the top left here is from 1926, and this is what the Los Angeles River looked like. 
It was a very large, dynamic, fine-grained stream. Uh, it had very flashy flood events through time. Um, and then on the bottom right here, this is closer to present day, and this is what it looks like now. The channel is now all through the town of Los Angeles, um, has been completely concreted uh, on the bed and banks. Um, and of course, following this, uh, there's very little to no biological function whatsoever in the stream anymore, of course. Uh, fish can't uh, swim through this anymore. Uh, plants can't grow, obviously, in the concrete, except in little patches of deposition, uh, which is amazing that they're still there, actually. But um, obviously, it highly affects the natural function. Uh, so moving forward, of course, we need to find a balance when we're doing restoration activities uh, between having uh, protecting human infrastructure as well as uh, having natural functions for streams. Uh, so one way that we like to sort of uh, sum this idea up of what Hallie was hinting at with letting rivers move, uh, move and uh, making room for the river and so on is uh, through this figure. So basically the, uh, the geomorphology of a stream, which is just the science of how the stream changes through time, uh, can be perceived as this four-dimensional uh, figure, which sounds really fancy, but basically a river just moves, can move and adjust uh, through space and time. And within space, uh, there's three degrees of freedom, if you would like to call it that, uh, that the river can adjust. You have the vertical component where it can move up and down uh, through uh, time, and then you have the lateral component where it goes back and forth. Uh, and uh, can meander, as people know, as sinuosity in the stream. Uh, and then, of course, up and down the valley as well, longitudinally. Uh, and then all of those dimensions of space uh, um, fluctuate within time on the temporal scale, uh, which is often something that people uh, forget about. Uh, well, why this is important is everything we've done as humans in river corridors have affected these degrees of freedom. And what we use this for is basically uh, how we have affected that degree of freedom can relate to what type of restoration uh, goals and actions that we take to restore the stream. Uh, so for instance, uh, a bridge crossing uh, a river uh, can constrain the river laterally because it forces the river to uh, converge through the opening of the bridge. Uh, and sometimes if uh, can also, um, uh, 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 sorry, affect the vertical component as well. Uh, if there's riprap or concrete on the bottom of the stream under the crossing, right, that uh, doesn't allow the river to move up and down. Uh, things like riprap, infrastructure next to the uh, stream, all those type of things uh, affect these degrees of freedom. Uh, so another concept that we've been sort of discussing uh, the last few years uh, that we've come up with being in this restoration field and trying to conceive sort of uh, this interface between uh, sort of more traditional engineering and uh, humans and infrastructure, and then the natural side and, and natural riverine health and function. Uh, and to us, it, it really comes back uh, to how we perceive uh, channel stability or river stability. Um, and we set this up sort of on a spectrum of extremes. Uh, so on the far left side, um, this is uh, an extreme scenario of traditional engineering in a waterway, right? Where, uh, again, just like the LAR, we have uh, concreted the bed and banks. And as you see here, of course, besides this hero of a plant growing somehow in the concrete, uh, there's no biological activity in this channel. The, the river, the natural river health and function is non-existent, basically, although it's good for what we uh, want it to be uh, as a storm drain in the urban area, right? So in this sense, uh, uh, how we perceive stability is no change, being static, right? A no change of response equals stability. Uh, and this makes sense in a civil engineering, a traditional civil engineering sense of we have bridges, we have roads, obviously buildings, all these type of things cannot move, obviously. <laughs> they can't be dynamic and they stay in place and that's what they need to do. Although when we interface that with the natural environment uh, that needs to be dynamic and move and will, uh, we'll have a battle. Um, so on the far other end of the spectrum, what we argue is best uh, the best way to perceive stability for uh, river health of function um, is more along the lines of the way we perceive stability in the geomorphological and yeah, in ecology uh, is really the ability to change and respond equals uh, stability. 
basically the opposite idea, right? Um, if the river is uh, in this picture, for instance, a more naturalized river has its vertical lateral longitudinal degrees of freedom and therefore can respond uh, to disturbance events such as floods and fires and people uh, taking water out for diversions and uh, putting in infrastructure, changes in the water and sediment flowing through the stream, uh, the stream can respond to those changes and therefore be resilient through time, as Hallie was mentioning earlier. So then the, why this is important too, is that this directly relates to the treatments that we have for river restoration, right? Since this is a spectrum, these are the extreme cases. Obviously, we're not gonna concrete rivers everywhere and, we're, and we can't just let uh, them be completely natural everywhere either. So uh, everything else basically is in between, right? And we need to find ways to uh, uh, tread that line and try to get as much as we can uh, out of the natural system while retaining uh, the, uh, the health and safety of uh, humans that live in the river corridor as well. Uh, and obviously that's a very big challenge. Oh yes, this is just showing the degrees of freedom. So again, this is just uh, reiterating the same thing. This is Lost Edges River again on the uh, left and then uh, another more natural stream on the right. Um, and uh, basically, again, we just need to find ways to, to be in between. But the way that we uh, perceive stability can relate to the treatments that we propose. Some people have the idea that streams should be static and therefore want to hold them in place, even in a more natural setting than a restoration setting. And we would argue that we just need to keep pushing, sorry, keep pushing toward uh, having uh, more uh, dynamic uh, features uh, involved in restoration activities wherever possible. And would argue that uh, there's opportunities that are missed with it, I guess. There's people that we can do it in more areas than people think. Obviously now, since this is built out this way in Los Angeles, there's very little we could do to bring it back to this, but there's areas all over the country where we have opportunities still to allow this to happen more than we might think. So as we've been mentioning earlier, um, this idea of resilience uh, is directly and very closely tied to disturbance and as we can call it ecological disturbance. Uh, in the study uh, of ecology, uh, looking at natural ecosystems, um, uh, ecosystems have adapted uh, to what they call disturbance regimes, uh, which can be things like flood events and fires uh, on a natural setting. And there's been a lot of species uh, that have adapted to having that. And in fact, actually rely on that disturbance to occur uh, for, their own, for them to establish and have their normal life cycle occur. Uh, and we're starting to learn more and more about that as uh, the field of ecology uh, expands and uh, continue to learn about it. This right here is a, is a quote that I won't read entirely. Uh, it's from Ellen Wall, which is a professor at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. She's been a big advocate for this type of thing uh, related to river management and, uh, and restoration. And basically the word she's using in here is messy, messiness. And we use that word all the time to say, uh, when floods occur, they leave a messy river behind. Uh, and as you see in this photo, it's spread out everywhere and cause erosion and all these things. Uh, but the natural system has adapted for that uh, to occur. And all those, uh, all that messiness is diversity of habitat for different plant species, different aquatic uh, fish species, and, and so on and so forth. Um, different bird species that occupy different parts of the canopy of different tree heights and all these type of things. And all that diversity uh, leads to resilience. Oh, sorry. Uh, so just quickly how these, uh, some the, ben the benefits of ecological disturbance expand on that a little bit. Here's some photo examples here. Um, this is actually uh, from a project reach of a restoration project that Johannes will talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Um, that was really well functioning. Um, and uh, therefore we didn't touch it, uh, which is a topic that in restoration is, uh, uh, needs to be expanded on more. Um, sometimes things are working well, we can not touch that and focus on areas that aren't working as well and need a lot more support. Uh, so here is a, a classic example of a species that needs this disturbance. This is young Plains cottonwood trees, which is the main riparian spe uh, tree species in Colorado, all Colorado rivers outside of the mountains. 
Um, and the species has adapted to disturbance. So it needs a freshly scoured area and freshly deposited surfaces um, in order for their seeds to establish and for them to grow up. And this is occurring in this area preceding the 2013 floods that Hallie talked about. So some of the flooding was uh, good for the natural system to provide that disturbance, but obviously bad uh, for uh, human infrastructure and areas. Um, other things like this is gigantic wood jams here that now is crowding, uh, causing a diverse habitat from erosion and sedimentation around this tree, as you can see here, different depths of water that different aquatic species occupy. And it's creating erosion on the bank on the far side here, which most people perceive as bad, but is actually inputting more sediment into the river that it needs. And then as you see on the bottom here, it can uh, erode till a tree follows in, and then that creates another log dam, and the cycle continues. It's a natural cycle of the system. So the more we can use these type of features uh, in restoration uh, and find creative ways to interface it with um, human infrastructure and needs of the river, the better. So now I'm gonna. Um, so now that comes to the question: So how do we do this? How do we plan and manage and design for resiliency? Uh, so I'll hand it on over to Johannes uh, to start talking about that. And Travis, really quick, I'm going to launch another poll here for everyone to make sure we're all yeah, sorry. still uh, paying attention, but that was really interesting. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to launch this second one, one moment. So this question um, asked, what is most important to you about the Poudre River? And if you don't live on the Poudre River, just think about your home river, or your favorite river. Um, and this is a question that we ask when we do community outreach for um, projects uh, like Travis and um, Johannes are gonna talk about today. So these are really important um, to help understand, you know, those values that are most important to the community living on or near the river. And you're welcome to choose your top three. I'll give you a couple more seconds here, but it's like we have a lot of people answering. And Carol Cochran says she'd like to choose all. I agree. <laughs> it's it's tough to pick top three on these. All right, and I'm going to end the poll here and I will share the results so you all can see. So, uh, yeah, it looks like a river health to support ecosystems is definitely top for everyone. A natural river setting and then wildlife, um, of course, water supplies. So thank you all for answering that. All right, and I'll hand it over to Johannes. Okay, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I'm calling in from the field, so. Um, but, uh, so let's start. So thank you, Travis, for handing it off. So, you know, now that we're in restoration, how do we plan, manage, design for resiliency? So if we can go to the next slide, I'm gonna walk through um, some general high level stuff, but then kind of get where we talk a little bit specifics about what we can do. Um, so I am, Travis, can you go to the next slide? I'm still seeing the so how do we plan slide, but I'm a. Johannes, you're breaking out a little bit. Can you hear us? Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yep. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're just breaking out a little bit. So go ahead. And if if we lose Johannes, Travis, you might if not. Have to Travis will try to wing it, but um, yeah. Um, maybe turn off your video, Johannes. Can you do you got it, Travis? Then I'm sorry. I will we'll turn off my video. Yeah, turn can you guys off. hear me now? Yeah. Okay. okay. Everything sounding better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Cool. Sorry. All right, we'll, we'll have Travis take Basically, over. Basically, you know, one of the biggest questions we ask ourselves when, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll see if I, I'll, I'll do my best. 
I don't know if Johannes can hear, but I'll just go ahead and take over. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the biggest questions we asked ourselves to continue what Johannes was saying uh, is how much, uh, how much room does the river have to move and uh, can we give it more? Uh, so this is some pictures here of the Poudre River. Um, this is through Fort Collins here, if you're familiar, near Lincoln Avenue. Um, this is highly constrained through here. Obviously, you see the ribbon of riparian, um, riparian uh, vegetation there. Uh, and there is infrastructure uh, on this river right side down here. However, there's not on the river left side here. So maybe there's opportunities in that area, for instance, to um, expand the floodplain there and give the river some more room. Uh, this, uh, this picture on the bottom here is uh, an area on the Poudre further down uh, that has a lot of room and hasn't, have, it hasn't had infrastructure um, constrain it, uh, the floodplain and therefore you can see what it looks like. It's uh, amazing from our perspective of a river health and function uh, standpoint. It uh, has multi-thread channels through here and great diversity of uh, plant and animal species throughout. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the things is sort of hitting that on the last slide is open spaces uh, can be our heroes, right? So some, there's been this term and the, the literature has talked about beads on a chain, uh, which is just the concept of there's these areas or beads that uh, have more room for the river to move and therefore on the chain of the river. And maybe those areas are where we can allow the river to move more. And those are great opportunities for that. And while we have to stay constrained in other areas because of just the reality of uh, infrastructure that's been built next to the river and so on, that just can't be moved. Um, so uh, these areas, so this is a map on the right side here of the open space, uh, open spaces uh, on the Poudre River in, in Fort Collins. Uh, and there's quite a bit actually, which is, um, which is great. And there's uh, amazing opportunities um, at those. Uh, what's, uh, what those will do, obviously, when they're flooded, they'll allow for this disturbance in those areas and create that diversity of habitat that we've been talking about. It will also um, dissipate flood energy when those big floods happen, like 2013. If you can imagine coming down the stream and then you open them to this wide area, all that water spreads out and then reduces the velocities or erosive power that would otherwise go right downstream and maybe uh, a road out near a road or a building. Um, and it also, along with that spreading out of the water, it also spreads out uh, sediment, um, yeah, which again, can uh, fill up near bridges and cause disturbance uh, near other uh, types of infrastructure as well. Um, I can try to jump in one more time, Travis. Okay. I don't know if you can hear me any better. Uh, yeah, I think it sounds good. Uh, this is the River Bluff side. Is that what you're seeing? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try, but then shut me down if it doesn't work. And you, you go. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So, um, everything sounding okay right now? Yes. Is everything sounding okay, Travis? Or? Yep. Okay, so this is the River Bluff uh, site. So this was a project that uh, we constructed, designed and constructed about two or three years ago. It's in Larimer County near Windsor. And so this is a project of uh, a less constrained setting, an open space, an area where there's less infrastructure that we have to deal with. So this is an area where we can let the river open up like Travis was just talking about and deposit sediment. So as you can see, the channel in this picture was historically channelized. It was pushed over so it could fit underneath the bridge. So our approach, if we go to the next slide, Yep, our approach was to basically restore the system processes. And what that means is allowing for sediment transport, for sediment deposition. So it's just a high level picture of our designs through here, but you can see all those blue channels on the floodplain are overflow paths or during floods, water can spread out onto this floodplain when before there was a berm along the channel and it was totally disconnected. So one of the things we really focused on here is creating this kind of bead in the chain that we mentioned before that, that uh, it, it's an area where the river can move and adjust through time as needed. So let's go to the next slide. 
And so how we did this was a couple different ways. We, one of the first and biggest things we always talk about we did was we actually moved fences back. So both sides of the channel here were leased out agricultural fields. So one of the biggest things we talked to the county about was can we take some of that land back for the river, make a buffer. So we actually did move the fences back 25 feet to 150 feet, depending on where they were along the channel. And what this allows for is in future flood events, the channel can move if it needs to, and trees can fall in and you get more wood supply that way. Next slide. And so the other major thing that I kind of mentioned quickly was floodplain connection. Like Travis said, energy dissipation, we get flood water and sediment attenuation. So these are a couple pictures, the bottom end, you see the channel beforehand on the left and then the channel on the right uh, afterwards, which basically we cut that berm down and we completely open this floodplain. So on a annual or by or, or like every two year basis, we would get water spread out across the floodplain. And we have seen a lot of sediment deposition through time out here. Next slide. And then, so these are just a couple quick techniques. So if you look at the uh, uh, two photos on the top, these are overflow channels. So the river, the left picture is pre-construction and that arrow is pointing to the exact kind of same area, the ye yellow area the right picture shows an overflow path. So that's what we mean, this picture was taking a peak flow and you can see water's getting out and spreading out across that whole area, across the floodplains before it was kind of caught in the channel. And then the bottom picture is before construction on the left was that berm that was built up. And then that's where we cut through the berm and opened up another channel that during the larger flood events flow will really go through as well. Next slide. And then, you know, did it work? You know, as Travis mentioned earlier with cottonwoods, plains cottonwoods, you really need that disturbance. We saw hundreds, if not thousands of cottonwoods grow up the first year after construction after peak flow. So we created that dis disturbance to the restoration, but we also got continued disturbance through the peak flows. And that's really seen a really big cottonwood recruitment. So hopefully this area will become a new cottonwood gallery through here, through time. Next slide. And so, you know, that's great, but we can't allow for this disturbance everywhere. You know, those are unconstrained settings. Those are open spaces. So if you hit next, Travis, it'll pop up and it'll say that, you know, that's true. You know, we can't really let the river move in all these places, but more often than not, the opportunities are missed. And all of these photos are actually Poudre River and actual areas where the channel could move. They're open spaces. You know, the 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 Poudre River Trail is seen in there in the distance. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But like Hallie mentioned, moving the trail out of the way should be one of the first things we should be asking ourselves. And the one on the top left was also an open space through City of Fort Collins, where instead of opening up the floodplain and really allowing sediment to deposit the river to adjust through time, there's been boulder line banks. So this river's locked in place again. So these are kind of that missed opportunities that happens too often in our kind of industry. Next slide. So uh, this just brings me the last thing I'll talk about. I know we're running out of time, but this brings me back to the REACH 13 project that Hallie mentioned at the beginning. We're currently working with CPRW to come up with furthered concept designs for this REACH 13. Uh, so you go to the next slide. So uh, this comes to the idea of the beats in the chain that Travis previously mentioned before, but this is a aerial photo of the reach extents. You can see the blue is reach 13 essentially, and the purple lines are kind of showing how constrained and how locked in the river, how thin it is. It's that chain part. And then it really opens up when it hits reach 13. The floodplain, is, it's still kind of disconnected, but it's an area where the infrastructure goes the way and the river is gonna be depositing sediment, an area where we do expect the river to be more dynamic through time. So we're trying to work with that. So we go to the next slide. So here, Hallie showed these previously. These were very high level concepts we came up with uh, as part of the Lower Pooter Master Plan Resiliency Plan. So like Hallie said, these were what we could do if, if you know, we weren't considering private landowners or anything, roads, trails, what, we're gonna move the trail, we're gonna make bridges bigger. This was kind of a high level, like what's the best we can do for the river, give it the most room as possible. But if you go to the next slide, as we're getting underway in this project, you'll see that these polygons pop up and these polygons, there's actually should be a couple more 
on here that show um, future mining. So, uh, sorry, I might be, oh, there they are. Okay, so there's actually a couple more polygons that should show in here. So we do have future mining that's gonna happen along the river, which is a, an example of a working river. Everyone calls it a working river. So this is something that will happen. And, uh, and the question, so after the mining happens, a lot of this will go back to ponds, right? So already from this kind of what we thought might be an unconstrained setting, we're already starting to get hemmed in with what we can do because right along the river, 200 foot buffer on either side, we're gonna have ponds. So if we go to the next slide. So after being in the field for initial assessments, you know, we're kind of thinking, what are these design challenges? What, what's challenging us from really doing something resilient out here? So the top left, the gravel mining I mentioned before, it's not the mining itself that's challenging, but it's how it's restored afterwards. A lot of them get turned into ponds for water rights because it's an easy thing to do. But can we maybe turn that back to floodplain? Can we fill the pond back in? You know, it, it's going to be a little more expensive, but maybe that's something we can do. And then the top right, the Poudre Trail, and we have the Jones Ditch. You can see the river on one side, the trail on the opposite side. And then the, the ditch even farther from that. So we have areas where they're right next to each other. So these are areas where we can talk about, can we move the trail? And we're talking to Greeley and Windsor and, and we're trying to come up with a new, new alignment that gets the trail out of the way. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And then private property, working with private landowners, you know, is the vision the same as our future development, things like that. And then the bridge itself at the downstream end is also really small for the river down there. So that's also another constraint for resiliency. Ideally, it's a larger bridge. The river can move as it needs to underneath the bridge. Next slide. And I just have a couple more. So hopefully we're not going too long so we have time for questions. But um, with this next slide, basically high level constraint settings, what can we do? So the first question we ask is, can we remove or move those constraints, i.e. the trail, which I'll show next. Can we use offset protection? So too often in those photos you see we put riprap right along the banks when the, the infrastructure protecting is 100 feet back. Can we bury that riprap back at the, at the infrastructure and allow the river to move for those 80 feet up to that riprap? It's a lot more resilient approach to allow that to happen. It's an energy dissipator and it's actually gonna help the infrastructure better as opposed to having riprap, which then maybe gets flanked and now the river can run right to the infrastructure. And then connecting floodplain again, is always a great way to dissipate energy during flooding events. Next slide. So this is a this is a great way uh, picture here. This is part of the Lower Poudre Master Plan concept, and this is um, uh, a picture, a concept of what we talk about with the trail realignment. So the existing trail used to be right along the river, but this is a way you know we all love the river. We want to bike along the river, but is there a way where we can have the concrete trail? In areas like inside bends where it can come up close, close to the river, great. In areas on outside bends where you expect that river to move and get closer to the trail, can we have it offset farther back? And instead we can put a dirt trail closer to the river. So if the river takes out the dirt trail, that's okay. So coming up with ideas where people can still interact and enjoy the river, but having it a more resilient approach with the concrete infrastructure farther away means we never have to put riprap on the bank, ideally. Next slide. And Jones Ditch is right within our reach too. So this is a diversion structure. During 2013, this actually blew out. So they had to go back in and throw in a bunch of rock and hold that whole cross section. So we're gonna look at uh, ways where we can actually connect floodplain around this diversion structure. So during big flood events, it's not hopefully gonna have that same impact it did the first time. Next slide. Uh, so real quick, the channel itself, like Travis mentioned before, through Reach 13, it's actually great. There's wood in the channel, complex habitat. So one thing we're not doing is touching the channel. We might add some more large wood into the channel for the river to create some more scour and stuff through time, but we are not going to be going in here and redoing the whole channel. It's good. We're going to leave it alone. Next slide. And floodplain connection will be a big part of Reach 13, just like River Bluffs upstream, open it up. So during future events, we don't have much infrastructure around here, let the river move, let it adjust, attenuate flood water and catch sediment there so it doesn't go downstream to an area where it might cause the channel to move a little bit more in a place we're not okay with it doing that. Next slide. Uh, last couple of slides, beavers, I have to bring up beavers, you know, 
there, it, it's a mixed combo. Some people love beavers. Some people hate beavers. But beavers are really good for an ecosystem. They do really create complex habitat. And we do have beavers upstream and downstream of Reach 13. And they can be a nuisance. So can we create this haven in Reach 13 where they can do what they need to and not be a, not uh, kind of block up infrastructure or cause issues? So it's a thing where we want to try to do with this project. Next slide. And then finally, final slide, uh, big takeaways. So you've heard all this, it was like a fire hose, I'm sure. But the big key takeaways that we hope people can leave with are that, you know, the traditional view of channel stability, so how we used to view rivers, that stable was healthy and stable was, was going to stop flooding, it's ended up locking rivers in place and it's reduced resiliency. It's actually done the opposite. So as, as the science progresses, we're starting to learn other approaches. And we're starting to learn that ecological disturbance plays a big role in river health and function. We need that disturbance like Travis mentioned before. And then finally, you know, it is possible to allow for natural ecological disturbance that fosters resilience, even in constrained environments. So again, we need to start asking ourselves, can we move infrastructure? Can we do other things besides just the typical put rip wrap in a bend because we see a bank failing? So I think that with that, I'll finish. I know we're almost out of time and I'm sorry if there was a delay, but hopefully that worked out okay. Awesome, thank you, Johannes. That was excellent. Thank you, Travis and Hallie. Um, I'm, let's see here. I'm gonna go to some questions because we do have a few minutes here for some questions. Uh, let's see. So in our Q and A here, um, a question from Sandy Lovato. Is it true that the Pooter is the only river in the U.S. that is naturally flowing and not dammed. Um, so, Sandy, that's a great question. Um, so, the the Poudre River, um, I think maybe what you're thinking of is uh, the Upper Poudre is uh, considered wild and scenic. It has the wild and scenic designation. Um, so, uh, that designation is a federal uh, designation that was handed down, I think, in the '80s to that section of the Poudre River. Um, so that area uh, is undammed. Um, there are still quite a few diversions throughout the entire river. Um, Hallie, if you want to speak any more to that, um, but I guess the answer would be that um, it, it's true that in, in Colorado, it's the only wild and scenic river. Um, yes. yep. There are many rivers throughout the country that are naturally flowing and undammed. Um, but yeah, Hallie, if you have anything to add to that. No, I don't think so, but yeah, great question. And as Megan said, it's the only river in Colorado with that designation, but um, the Pooter does have lots of diversions and um, and reservoirs off of it. So it's a, we like to call it a working river. Um, so it's really important for agriculture and it, you know, and water supply, water quantity for um, all of, the agriculture in the eastern part of um, of the watershed. Great, thank you. Um, Beth Stevens asks, how will the proposed dam, um, I believe she's speaking of NISP, affect the kinds of ideas of allowing the um, quote unquote river to be a river that you are all discussing? Um, she's part of the CSU extraction exhibition. And we'll be discussing this as part of our Poudre River Walk on September 10th. Does anyone want to tackle that question? <laughs> yeah, that's um, a tough question, um, but it's a really relevant one. So um, I think, you know, if if the Northern Integrated Supply Project happens, um, you know, that it will have impacts obviously to the river, but CPRW as an organization, we um, we will be here to do what we can to help mitigate those impacts um, and and to allow the river to be a river in the, in the areas that, um, that it still can be. It's just, it's similar to, you know, areas where the river's already constrained, um, especially in the city of Fort Collins and in the lower watershed city of Greeley, Town of Windsor, et cetera. There's, there's always been developmental pressures. There's um, other, you know, water supply infrastructure, and um, so there's still, op I think, there will still be opportunities um, to increase resiliency of the river and and make room for the river, uh, and implement those um, those different ideas that both Travis and Johannes talked about. Great, thank you. And Deborah Schulman, 
Um, if you need to plan for a resilient river through time, we should be considering the spring flood flows that restore and clean the river channel each year. You can see the fire silt in the river near Watson Lake now and in many other places, unfortunately. And when NISP and the pipeline are built, how will the river be able to clean itself annually and maintain those cottonwoods so important to river resiliency? Yeah, again, this is a this is a pretty complex question. Um, so the, within the NISP mitigation plan, if you guys are interested, you can access that, I think, online. Um, they have made plans for allowing um, you know, basically turning on the water to help flush and close to wash sediment down. Um, but of course, you know, it's, it would be a reservoir on the river. So, you know, the impacts will be there, um, but you can access that information online. So as I mentioned, you know, CPRW, we're, we're, we'll be here to do what we can um, to, you know, make sure that the river can still maintain its function um, and, as best as possible um, if a development like this were to happen. Great, thank you, Holly. Those are all great questions. And then I've got, we have time for one last uh, one here from Ricky. Uh, Travis, if you can answer this, he says, it's very exciting to see such an extensive project in the works. What is the timeline of the design shown and will it be implemented in phases? Yeah, I'm assuming reached their teams that we're talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're in the conceptual design phase right now um, for the whole reach. Uh, and I guess my understanding, uh, some of that will yet to be seen depending on funding that we get. Um, we have talked about doing a phase approach if we need to. Um, but uh, obviously, it'd be great to do it all at once, and we hope so. But it will depend on the funding we're able to get in the next design phases. Um, moving past the conceptual level. The concepts right now, we um, are going to have done in them uh, this year, like at the conceptual level, so. And then uh, I can just quickly add about the NIST thing quick. Um, I, I think, as we've been saying, it's, it's a very huge challenge. And yes, it will uh, strain the river more if, from my perspective, and it will make it harder for the river to have its natural processes. But I guess all I could say is it make, to me, it makes even um, more of a strong point for us to push our treatments and management toward the, that uh, dynamic side of the spectrum that we talked about and giving the river room and ability to uh, change through time back, its degrees of freedom back. Uh, because for instance, one thing that can happen even naturally in a watershed, say climate changes and you have less water in a watershed, uh, what a, a river that can adjust through time, what it will do uh, is since less water is coming down, less uh, sediment is able to be moved, therefore it will start depositing in the stream and the channel will start narrowing itself. And then eventually once it narrows itself, it reaches a new state uh, where it's able to start transporting and flushing sediment again like it had previously in the old hydrologic regime, right? So if we're able to give the river those, uh, the ability and function back uh, wherever we can, it will be helpful or the best we can do at least. Great, thank you so much, Travis, for speaking to that. Um, so unfortunately, everyone, we are out of time here. I will, um, uh, there was a question about our next volunteer opportunities at CPRW. Um, we will be having opportunities um, in the fall and then over the coming years to do post-fire restoration work and then um, possibly opportunities in the lower Poudre watershed as well in the coming years. Um, but um, upcoming opportunities can be found um, through our newsletter, social media, and then we also have a uh, volunteer sign up. So I will put that link in the follow-up email that will come out tomorrow as well as uh, contact information for our speakers, which some people requested. Um, but I just want to thank you all for joining us today and taking time to um, maybe have your lunch and listen to this great presentation. And thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, I know I learned a, a ton from them and we're so happy to work with Travis and Johannes and uh, um, have Hallie's leadership as well. So thank you all for coming and have a great yes, afternoon. Thanks everyone.